All right, ready to dive into something kind of wild. Always up for a good deep dive, especially when it involves biblical prophecy and, uh, well, let's just say some unconventional theories. That's putting it mildly, right? We're digging into more of Samuel Tuominen's book, To Whom the Majesty of Kingship Has Not Been Conferred, The Antichrist Revealed. You guys sent in excerpts and chapters five through eight. Let me tell you, this is where Tuominen's ideas about King Charles, you know, maybe fulfilling the role of the Antichrist. Yeah, it gets intense. We're talking ancient predictions, historical figures, even Charles's own words. Yeah, he doesn't hold back. Not at all. Chapter five, right off the bat, Charles's Antichrist complex, even the chapter titles like, whoa, plus the book cover, you see that yeah. statue, Charles with angel wings, like he's, I don't know, saving the world. It's definitely a choice. But it does make you think about how Charles is often portrayed. I mean, larger than life figure, right? Exactly. And of course, everyone's thinking Charles, Antichrist. He's too old, not popular enough, not exactly what you'd call, well, charismatic, right? And this is where Tuominen flips the script. Because those counter arguments, they actually strengthen his case. In a way, yeah. It's like he's anticipating those objections and using them to his advantage. Like that whole uncharismatic thing. Tuominok argues charisma is not always this inherent quality, right? It could be manufactured, carefully crafted. Think about it. So you're saying it's not about being naturally charming, but more about how you're perceived, especially by your follower. Exactly. Even figures who are deeply divisive manage to cultivate these incredibly devoted followings. And how does that apply to Charles? Well, Kuominer argues that Charles, he's been meticulously building this image, right? Mm -hmm. The thoughtful leader, environmental advocate, champion of interfaith dialogue. And he does have a point, right? Charles has been vocal about those things for decades. And then there's that quote from his book, Harmony. I mean, he talks about being born to, and I quote, save the world. Talk about a savior complex, right? Right. And that's what Tolman latches onto. Like, okay, maybe it's not that unusual for people to talk about wanting to make the world better. But then he brings in those biblical passages like Zechariah 11.1516. Which he interprets as describing someone who's the opposite of a healer, right? Someone who ultimately brings harm. Exactly. So he's creating this contrast between Charles's self-proclaimed mission, the whole saving the world thing, and how he interprets those specific prophecies. He's looking for those inconsistencies. Right. It's almost like he's saying, okay, you say you're here to heal the world, but what about this? And he even brings in Charles's personal life. Like his treatment of Princess Diana, for example. Yeah, he poses that question. If Charles is all about healing, why couldn't he heal his own marriage? Right, it's another layer to the narrative, right? It does. And then in chapter six, the king of the Jews and defender of faith, Tuominen throws another curveball. The idea that the Antichrist might be the king of the Jews. And this is where it gets even more complicated. Right, because King Charles is not, you know, Jewish. Exactly. But Tuominen argues that many biblical prophecies, they don't explicitly state that the Antichrist has to be Jewish by blood, right? It's more about fulfilling a certain role. So not about ethnicity, but about fulfilling a specific prophecy. Precisely. He brings up the British Israelite movement, you know, that group. They believe the British people are actually descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. Wait, seriously, I've never heard of that. They're out there. And get this, they claim King Charles is a direct descendant of King David. You're kidding, King Charles. That's like something out of, I don't know, the Da Vinci Code? Right. It's a pretty out there claim, but it plays into that whole King of the Jews prophecy. And then, to make it even more interesting, Tuominen mentions an article from the Jewish Chronicle. It suggests Charles could be the first British monarch to officially visit Israel. Wait, hold on, hold on. Didn't this book come out before that visit actually happened? It did. It's like Tuominen saying, look, I'm not making this up. So we have a potential, and I use that term loosely, king of the Jews, maybe descended from King David, making a historic visit to Israel. Okay, this is getting interesting. What about the defender of faith? Part of the chapter title. Right, right. Because Charles has talked about wanting to be a defender of faith, not just of the Christian faith. It's about modernizing the monarchy, being more inclusive. And Tuominen sees that as significant. Makes sense. Charles has been pretty vocal about those things. And Tuominen points to that push for a more interfaith coronation, maybe even incorporating elements of Islam. It's like he's saying, hey, look, Charles is distancing himself from traditional Christianity. Okay, so we've got a potential king of the Jews with a questionable family tree going back to King David, who's really into interfaith dialogue. And now we're bringing Islam into the mix. Where does he even go from here? Well... Tuominen, 
he kind of goes global in chapter seven. Syrian Antichrist, the coming Mahdi, and the Prince of Arabia. He breaks out literal maps for this. He's getting into where the Antichrist comes from geographically. Okay, so are we talking like birthplace? Where they rise to power? That's the debate, right. Yeah. Some scholars say the Western Roman Empire, others, they're all about a Syrian origin. Mm -hmm. You know, these big names Twomenin brings in, other writers, you know, some back Syria, others Greece. It's almost like an eschatology showdown. But Twomenin finds these threads from both and they lead right back to, you guessed it, Charles. Okay, hold up. How does Charles, King of England, fit into this whole Syrian Greek Antichrist idea? I'm missing something. You remember all that lineage stuff? Okay. Tolman brings it back around. Prince Philip, Charles's dad, born in Greece, which, according to Tolman, could give Charles a claim to the Greek throne, technically. Wait, really? Is that even, like, possible after all this time? Tolman ad admits it's a long shot. Yeah. But he's drawing this parallel to Antiochus Epiphanes, if you've heard of him. Some people see him as, like, a proto-antichrist, right? And guess what? Greek origins ruled over all this old Greek territory. It's like Tolman saying history is repeating itself, with Charles in the lead this time. I see where he's going with this. So, potential ties to the Roman Empire, a Greek connection. We've got the King of the Jews thing still floating around. But what about Islam? We haven't even touched on that yet. How does that fit into all of this? That's where it gets really wild. Tuomenin argues that Charles's interest in Islam, which we all know about, it's another piece of the puzzle. Remember those rumors about Charles maybe converting to Sufism? Oh, yeah. Those have been going around forever. Right. Well, Tolmanin takes those rumors seriously. He even talks about this prominent Sufi sheikh who supposedly predicted that Charles would be a close advisor, like a minister, to the Mahdi. Hold on, the Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah figure? Is he saying that Charles, who might be the Antichrist, could also be a high-ranking official in the Mahdi's, what, administration? My head's spinning a little bit. I know, right? <laughs> That's a lot. But Tuomenin's suggesting that maybe, just maybe, the biblical Antichrist and the Islamic Mahdi, they could be the same person. He's not saying it's definite, but he's looking for those overlaps, those places where prophecies might, like, intersect. Okay, but for that to work, wouldn't the Maki have to fulfill some of the same criteria as the Antichrist? Exactly. And this is where Tuomenin drops another bombshell. He brings up genealogical research, and apparently King Charles is a descendant of, get this, the Prophet Muhammad. You have got to be kidding me. So not only might he be descended from King David, but he could also fit the bill for the Mahdi. This is getting out of hand. It's a lot to process, right? And Tuomenin knows it. He even says in the book that it's unusual for one person to potentially line up with this many prophecies. But that's his whole point. He's making these connections, suggesting that maybe we're not looking at separate prophecies, but this big intertwined web. Alaman da çöker. Fransız çökmeye hazır. İspanya çöker. İngilizli imparatorluktur. Lafı fazla salahiyetle gelecek bir şey. Örme Resi'den sonra yerine gelecek olan oğlu tam salahiyetle şey gelecek, hükme gelecek. Ne parlamanı dinler, ne efendim e, ötekiler, lordlar, lordlar, onun tarafıdır zaten. Süpür edecek parlamanları. O zaten tebelendi o kıl, kırmalar çok yok, yıkılacak. Şeyin içinden kaynayıyor. Pelestin meselesinde, Yine Orta Şark'a hükmedecek, on devlete hükmedecek bir sultan gelmiş. Demokrasi dediği başları ayak yapan sistem, ayakları baş yapan. Hepsi de kahrolacak. Olsunlar. 
Hepsi de zaliplerdir. Hepsi de tükeneceklerdir. Bir para kalmayın. Önlemi bu ayetin okuyup kaçın. So going into chapter 8, we've got all these prophecies, historical figures, and they all seem to be pointing to King Charles. What's Tormenon's next move? Does he just keep connecting dots? He does. In chapter 8, the prince who is to come at the last Roman emperor, he starts tying it all together. He reminds us how many of those prophecy boxes Charles seems to check. He even says that Prince William, Charles's son, doesn't really fit the description of that despised crown prince figure the same way Charles does. So he's saying even within the line of succession, Charles is like the chosen one. In a way, yeah. But he doesn't stop there. He brings up Emmanuel Macron and that whole ten nation coalition thing he's got going on in Europe. Tuomenon suggests it could be like those ten horns of the beast from Daniel 7. Is he saying Macron's a potential antichrist too? Not exactly. He doesn't come right out and say that about Macron. More like maybe he's playing a part, getting things ready, but then he circles back to Charles and this idea of the Antichrist being the last Roman emperor. Wait, how does Charles, the King of England, fit into that? Remember how Tuomenon is really into titles and what they really mean? He points out that Prince of Wales, which Charles was before he became king, it translates to Prince of the Romans. Wow, I never knew that. Prince of the Romans. That's uh, pretty specific. Mm. And kind of creepy, given everything else we've been talking about. Right. And then he takes it even further, mm. bringing up Prince Titus, the Roman general who destroyed the Second Temple in Jerusalem. Titus was a prince who became emperor. Tuomenon connects that back to the prophecy in Daniel 9. So he's saying that Titus fulfilled that prophecy about a prince who gains a lot of power, and now Charles might fulfill that prince who is to come prophecy, like history repeating itself, but with King Charles this time. Exactly. He's weaving these historical echoes with biblical prophecy, and it all builds this narrative where Charles is a central figure in how these ancient predictions play out. Okay, but this is where I get tripped up. We're talking about prophecies and timelines that cover centuries. How can he even begin to connect those dots in a way that makes sense? That's a good question. And this is where Tuomenon gets really into the weeds. He digs into the timeline in Daniel 9.2426. A lot of biblical scholars believe this passage is key to understanding end times prophecy. It talks about a decree to rebuild Jerusalem, a certain number of years, and then bam, something really important happens. I'm with you so far, but what's so important about this decree to rebuild Jerusalem? And what does it have to do with King Charles? Tuomenon focuses on when this decree happened. He uses this method of calculating time that's common in biblical prophecy. It uses 360-day years instead of our regular 365-day years. And by his calculations, the timeline in Daniel 9, using those prophetic years, it lines up perfectly with when most people believe Jesus was crucified. So he's saying that this passage in Daniel predicted the timing of Jesus' crucifixion centuries before it happened. That's what he's saying. And then he does something even more interesting. He's saying that the timeline from Daniel 9, which might have accurately predicted Jesus' crucifixion, it also points to a huge event that could happen while Charles is on the throne. It's like he's saying that just as that timeline in Daniel led to a massive event with Jesus, it could lead to another massive event, but with Charles at the center this time. Wow, that's a bold statement. But if this prophecy in Daniel really did predict when Jesus was crucified, wouldn't that mean that whatever happens during Charles' reign would have to be just as big, just as world-changing? That's exactly the question Tuamanen wants us to ask. He doesn't give us all the answers, but he's definitely suggesting that this potential event, this fulfillment of prophecy, would be a major turning point in history. It could reshape the world as we know it. So we're left with this like this huge event, maybe, that could change everything, and it's all because of how Tuomenin reads this timeline in Daniel. But he doesn't tell us what it is, right? It just kind of leaves us hanging. He does, and that's what makes it so fascinating. He gives us these clues, these little hints, pointing to other parts of the Bible, other historical events, and he says they might tell us what's coming. Okay, so clues. What kind of hints are we talking about? What does he say about this world-changing event? One of the biggest clues he gives is this idea of the times of the Gentiles. Have you heard of that before? I think so. It's about like a time when non-Jewish nations would rule over Jerusalem. You got it. And Tormenin, he connects that to what's happening in the world right now. He says that the Six-Day War back in 67, when Israel took back Jerusalem, that was a big deal. He even says that when the U.S. said Jerusalem was the capital of Israel back in 2017, that was even more proof that this prophetic timeline, it might be coming to an end. So if we're following Tuomenin here, the times of the Gentiles, they're over, which means 
What exactly? Well, according to his interpretation, it means everything's in place for those events in the 70th week of Daniel to start happening. That last week in Daniel's prophecy, it's a big deal, right? The Antichrist shows up, lots of chaos and destruction. This is starting to feel like we're in a movie, but keep going. So, the times of the Gentiles are over, that final prophetic week is next, and Charles is right in the middle of it all. Exactly. It's like he's saying, this is it, folks, the end game, and Charles is a major player. He's already made those connections to the Antichrist, and now he's saying these big prophetic events that could happen while Charles is king. It's a lot, and I'm sure some people listening are like, come on, this is crazy talk, but I have to say... The way Tawamanan ties it all together, biblical prophecy, history, what's happening in the world today, it's fascinating. It's like he's creating this whole new story, a possible future, and it's both really interesting and kind of scary at the same time. It is, and he does mm -hmm. it in a way that makes you really think, you know, makes you question everything you thought you knew about those old texts and if they mean anything for us today. So even if someone's not buying this whole King Charles is the Antichrist thing, there's still a lot to unpack here, right? He's making us ask some pretty big questions about faith, about power, and about the choices we make as a global community. 100%. And I think that's what makes Kuomintang's work so interesting, even if you disagree with him. He's not just making a prediction. He's offering a new way of looking at things, a way of looking at the world that makes us rethink everything and consider things we might not have thought about before. So where does that leave us? What's the takeaway after spending all this time on Twelman's book? The biggest takeaway for me is this. The future isn't set in stone. Prophecies, even ancient ones, they can be interpreted in different ways. Twelman's interpretation is definitely interesting. He's connecting those old warnings to the world we live in today. It's like he's saying, wake up everyone, pay attention. History might be repeating itself and we've got front row seats. Exactly. And whether you think his conclusions are scary, intriguing, or a little of both, he makes us look at the world in a new way. Maybe see things we didn't see before. He makes us realize that we all play a part in shaping what happens next. And that's what we're all about here on The Deep Dive. We explore these complex, sometimes controversial topics with open minds. We don't shy away from the big questions, and we're always looking for those new perspectives, even if they challenge what we think we know. So until next time, keep those minds open and keep diving deep.